Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to all take your seats. Thank you, team, for leading us in those songs. So we are, we are now in the final chapter of Revelation. We start chapter 22 tonight. So we're looking at the final chapter. We're at the final stage, the end of God's revealed oracles. So chapter 22, in many ways, is only showing us things we've already seen, but it's reconfirming and recapitulating on some things. So we're going to repeat some things tonight, but look at them in a different way or in more detail. Remember that the book of Revelation is the end of everything God's shown us. Jesus says he's the Alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the end. So just as Christ was the Word in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, now we've got Jesus revealed at the end. We've got Jesus revealed at the end of the book of Revelation, but it's still Jesus that we're seeing. And so if we can just bring up that first chart, please. And can you just bring up everything in one go? So if you remember, the last two chapters of Revelation, they are revealing to us the themes that God always planned right back at the beginning of Genesis. Okay, so in Genesis 1, you've got in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At the end of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, you've got the new heavens and the new earth. In Genesis, God, it's not good that man be alone. He needs a bride. At the end of Revelation, God sit, uh, reveals the bride coming down out of heaven. And we see the clothing that Adam lost in Genesis, regained in Revelation, the restoration of the garden, the river, the trees, everything's brought back, uh, the restoration of the light that God intended. You remember we looked at last time, there's no sun and moon, but everything's brighter. Um, God said, let there be light before there was a sun and moon. It's not natural light. It's a supernatural revelation that God gives us. Uh, life itself, obviously, uh, the tree of life is paramount to that, the river of life. And so God brings a revelation of the fullness of life in revelation. What, what is life? Might look at that tonight. And then obviously it's encompassed by this thing called the city of God that wasn't in the original creation, but God, uh, we're told in Hebrews, was planning and building a city uh, for us to inhabit. And we've seen the revelation of the city in Revelation chapter 21, and we've looked at that. We're going to look a little bit more uh, at that in a minute. So let's go to Revelation chapter 22 then, just read the first few verses, and uh, we'll see a few things straight away, more than we can look at. Uh, so just keep following down till I find a place to stop. So then the angel, so remember, the angel's taken John into the city, yeah? So they're in the city now. Before he sees the city coming down and he sees the external aspects of the city, the gates, the foundations, etc. But now he's seen the internal aspects of the city. Yeah. So then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. So there's the river of life, the river of the water of life, Haim Mayim, water of life flowing through the city, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne. So there's a throne in the city. Yeah. The throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. So there's, there's a there's movement in this city because there's a street and there's the river of the city. And on each side of this river, right? So there's the water of life, Haim Mayim. Now it's a river. Stood the tree of life, Etz Haim, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So we've still got time. We looked at that last time. And I know I confused a lot of you, but never mind. Uh, fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So there's nations in the city. No longer will there be any curse. The throne, so there's no curse in the city. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, as we've just seen, and his servants will serve him. So there'll be servants in the city. There'll be people, yeah, but they're called servants, yeah. So they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Whose foreheads? Well, you can't just say you, ours. <laughs> You've just imposed yourself there into the city. Now, 
Yes, the servants will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Okay, is there one more verse before we go into the next section? Okay, we'll leave it there. We'll not go into that section. We'll look at that next time. We'll not even get through what we've just looked at there. So, we looked at last time. Can you just look at the next chart? We looked at the things that are missing. So, the stuff that God had in the original creation that he doesn't have in the new heavens and the new earth and in the city. Can, if you can remember them, let's just bring them down one at a time. We'll not go into these at detail because we looked at them. There's no more sea. Yeah, the bitter waters. No more sea. We looked at that last time. Next one, there's no more night. Going to look at that again next time. What does that mean? And remember, it's repeated in Revelation there, 21 and 22, but it's also a confirmation of what happened in Genesis. God is a, a, an expert author, right? His conclusion perfectly matches his introduction. If you don't know the introduction, you won't understand what's happening in the conclusion. So there's no more curse. That's gone. Uh, there's no temple, but there is. If you know Eden, the Garden in Eden was a temple. There's no separate temple. There doesn't need to be because God's dwelling is with his people. So the temple building as such is not there. Five, there's no sun because the light of God is so bright you don't need the sun. He heats and warms everything. And there's no moon either. That's linked to the night, which we'll look at next time. And there's no sinners. Yeah, there's definitely no sin, but there's no sinners either. Okay, so there's no people who can cause sin. Yeah, you can get rid of sin. It's the people that's the problem, isn't it? You can get rid of sin, but then people keep inventing it. But there's no sinners, so it's not just sin is excluded. The capacity for sin is removed. Okay, so we looked at that next time. So let's go to the uh, let's go to the next chart. So inside the city, do you want to be inside the city? I've called this the city occupants. What's in this city? We've just listed a load of things that are in the city. But what do these things mean? Why are they there? Okay, the tree of life, the river, all this stuff. What, what does it all mean? Right, let's go to the first thing that they told us in Revelation chapter 22. Right, the first thing to understand is the throne is there. The first thing we read is these things are coming from the throne. They're flowing from the throne. Now understand, the city is the bride. So the bride's in the city, but the bride is the people, yeah? We looked at the gates and the foundations, and now they've got names. So there's a, there's a personification of all of these things. All of these things are not just things. They have a metaphorical meaning, as I'm sure you already know that. They're personifications of things. And if you can remember seven years ago, <laughs> can you remember seven years ago? Um, we did say we would look at, I did say we'll look at some of these things later on. Yeah, well, now we're at the level, now we're later on. So we're going to look, so if you were wondering why I'd not got to them, we're going to get to them. Okay, it's like all the promises to the overcomers, all the promises given to the overcomers in the seven churches are now here. They now exist. But you've probably forgot what the promises were. But they're here. So, You'll notice the things, when John's caught up to heaven and he's in the throne room of God, he sees certain things. And these are the things he sort of sees way back at the beginning. So he sees the throne. You remember? He's caught up into heaven. He's raptured into heaven. And he says, I saw a throne and someone seated on it. Yeah? And we know that's God the Father. Well, you'll see why in a minute. But... If you look at who else is on the throne with him and who else is with the throne, it's obvious the one on the throne is God the Father. Okay? It's God himself. Yeah? And so in Revelation 4, 2, 3, we don't need to turn to it, but you'll, um, you'll see there that then also there's the Lamb in the center of the throne. So, so it's God the Father on the throne and then the Lamb joins him. Yeah? 
So this is what we see now in the city at the end of time. Chapter uh, Next one, go, go down to number two. So the second thing we're told in Revelation 22 that we've just read is that the Lamb is there. Yeah? So when John was caught up to he heaven at the beginning of Revelation, the Lamb was also on the throne. Right? So you've got God the Father in the city. Now, I know all this is obvious. I know you think, well, this is obvious. This is ABC. I know, but it's important that we, we really nail this down. For example, why is he called the Lamb? I mean, how many titles does Jesus have? Isn't Jesus the King of Heaven? Yes. Isn't he the Prince of Peace? Isn't he the only begotten Son of God? Isn't he all light of light? God? Yes, but he's called the Lamb. Right, in Revelation, 34 times he's called the Lamb. That's a lot of times. So it would, it would be clear that it's the revelation of the Lamb that seems to be the most important revelation that God wants us to understand about Jesus. Now, without going through the whole Bible, there's a Lamb all the way through the Bible. There was a Lamb right at the beginning. I mean, they were clothed in skin, so that it doesn't tell us what animal was sacrificed for Adam and Eve, but it could have been a lamb. Uh, Cain and Abel gave offerings. It was Abel's offering of a lamb that was accepted. So from the beginning, you've got the lamb is the thing that God accepts. When Abraham offered Isaac, it was a, a, it was a, a ram, this picture of a, a sheep or a goat that was caught in the, in the thicket of the tree. So in Revelation 5, it's... It's the lamb that comes before the throne. Yeah? Uh, John the Baptist's introduction to Jesus was, Behold the Lamb of God. He called in the Lamb of God, and all the Jews knew what that meant. So we know what the lamb is. At the end of time in the city, he's not called the King of Kings. He was called that when he came and rode in victory. But in the city, he's called the lamb. We know him as the lamb. We know him as our sacrifice, the one who died for us. Yeah, and that's the title he is given. And the next thing we've just seen, it says the river, but it says the river flows from the throne and the Lamb. So it's a river, but it's coming from God the Father and God the Son. Now, once again, in fact, let's go there. Go to Revelation 4, verse 5. If you go to Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, where John describes the throne of the Father and the Lamb, Revelation 4, verse 5. So from the throne, so there's the Father on the throne, there's the, the Lamb on the throne, come flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. That's, a, that's an unfortunate translation. It's actually sevenfold spirit. It doesn't mean se seven separate spirits. It means one spirit in, in seven, uh, a sevenfold process. So the throne, we've got three things. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right? The center of the city is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're not referred to as that. It's Lamb, River, Throne. Yeah. Now, one of the things the Bible continually does, if you've read the Bible, you'll know that the Trinity is quite difficult to describe. Have you ever had anyone ask you, how do you describe the Trinity? And how do you describe the Trinity? Well, it's one God in three persons. You, well, <laughs> yeah, okay. What does that mean? Um, and so you use lots of metaphors and pictures and imagery to try and describe the Trinity. The problem is, the minute you do that, it's wrong. Yeah? Have you ever heard, have you ever heard this one? It's like water, ice, and steam. Yeah? It's all water. Water can be ice when it's frozen. It can be liquid in a temperate form, or if you boil it, it turns into a gas, steam, yeah? So the Trinity is like that. No, the Trinity is not like that. Because those, those three things can't be those three things at the same time. Right? They, they can't be all those three things at the same time. That's what's called uh, modalism. 
modalism is a heresy where God the Father became God the Son and then God the Son became God the Holy Spirit. No, they didn't. And the more you try and describe the Trinity, and lots of people do, and they write books about it, and the best way to understand the Trinity is you can't. Because if you could, then your mind would be equal with God. Just think about it. God has to be something that is transcendent to your thinking. Otherwise, it's something that can be contained in your thinking, and God isn't contained by your thinking. Your thinking is just your neurons firing in your brain. You will never comprehend God any more than an ant will comprehend you. Right? You can squash the ant. He still doesn't know who you are. As long as you have that, because when, uh, St. Patrick used, um, St. Patrick used, um, you know, the three-leaf clover, the shamrock. And when he was teaching the, 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 the Celtics, those pagans, my family's Celtic originally. And he says, it's like the shamrock. You know, it's one, it's one plant, it's one flower, but it's got three parts to it. Yeah, uh, yeah, but that's partialism. Because each one of those three parts is not the whole of the other parts. It's separate. So that's a heresy. So don't use that example. You ever use the, have, you, have you used this example? It's like the sun. It's a physical star, but yet it's heat and light. Yeah? Yeah, no, no, that's wrong as well. Because it, it, all of these three things aren't, aren't equal. Right? The light is not the star, and the star is not the light. And, the, and so that's, that's wrong as well. That's, that's, that's literally Arianism, which is a heresy. And so I, I suggest when you try and understand the Trinity, accept that you can't. That's the safest way. And people have written creeds, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and of all things visible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, who is one substance with the Father and the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And the more words you use to try and describe what the Trinity is, the more you sort of just end up in some kind of logical fallacy, because you can't fully describe it. It is who God is. So here, at the end of time, in the city of God, you've got the throne, you've got the Father, but the Lamb's also on the throne. You've got the Lamb, but the river's flowing from the throne of the Father and the Lamb. So the three in one have their own individuality, but they are perfectly united. God. They are all God, but there is only one God. Three persons. And so don't get confused about that. So this is what we've got at the center of the city. Go back to the chart then. So, Revelation 22 starts with those three things. So, the picture, the, the river is a picture of the Holy Spirit. We might look at that next time. Okay, so next it says this thing called the nations. Now, way back in Revelation, when we looked last time, you'll notice there's people of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue before the throne, worshipping God, right? There's going to be people saved from every nation. Greek ethnos. Every ethnicity is going to be saved. That's why racism is such a stupid idea. If you're a, Christ if you're a Christian, you can't be a racist. By definition, you're not a Christian because you're denying the purpose of what God is. God is the God of all nations. There's only one nation anyway. We all came from Adam and Eve. And now we all, those who belong to God's nation, all belong to Jesus Christ. Yeah? So, there's the, but there's still nations. There's still people from different identities, right? We've still got our individuality. Now, how many nations are there? Anybody like to guess? 144. <laughs> Joseph just said, who's counting? Do you know biblically there are 70 nations? There's 70. According to the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, there's 70 different nations. Yeah? Now, when Jesus picked the 12, then he picked 70 to send them out with the gospel. There's a gospel. There's a reason for that. Because the gospel is to go to all the nations. 
Now we think there's more. There's, I think there's, I think there's around two hundred. It, it goes up and down because new countries are born and disappear every year. You know, there used to be a country called Yugoslavia when I grew up. Now that's I don't know how many countries that is now. Um, and so yeah, there's around two hundred. But tracing it from the table of nations as God designs it. So you're talking about all the African nations, the European, Asian, all the seventy different. It comes from 70 different original patriarchs who would have been all different ethnic groups as we understand it. And so that's why Jesus picked 70 to go out. Uh, however, if you go to Luke chapter 10, go in the King James, Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. It's not that simple um, because... There, are, there is different ways of counting it. Go into the King James, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. So that's the NIV. This is the King James. After these things, the Lord appointed also other 70 also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. Go into the NIV. After this, the Lord appointed 72 and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he would go. Ooh, an error in the Bible. Is there an error? Well, 70 and 72 are not the same number, are they? The reason this number is different is, I'll, I'll not complicate this because it's not that important, the important thing is the 78. There's a different way of counting the original table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. There's always a different way of counting. Yeah? So if I said there's five people in my family, well, there's six, isn't there? Because I didn't count me. Yeah? In the Bible it says Noah and seven others were saved. So eight were saved. Yeah, but it says Noah and seven. Yeah? So it depends who you're counting. And when you're counting patriarchs, do you just count granddads or do you count dads and sons or where do you stop? It's quite difficult when genealogies uh, count. And if you think about this, well, let me, let me test you. Okay. How many tribes of Israel are there? Twelve. Who thinks twelve? <laughs> Who thinks 13? <laughs> Who thinks 14? I don't know. See, there's different ways of counting. You, you add them up. Yeah? You add them up. Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Yeah? Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh. Yeah? I'm going to get confused now. Uh, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Issachar, Gad, Zebulun, Joseph. You just said there were 12. But if you're clever, you see what happened there. I didn't, I didn't miss any tribe out. All those tribes are literal geographical tribes in the nation of Israel. But Levi wasn't given an inheritance. Levi was taken as a priestly tribe. And you'll notice I said Ephraim and Manasseh, which were tribes, they were given their own. But Joseph, they were two of Joseph's sons. So they were split in two. So you shouldn't count Joseph as well. Although in some of the lists, Joseph is it. On some lists, Dan's taken out. Yeah, so there are 12 original tribes, but Israel, Jacob, said to Joseph, your tribe will be two, yeah? I'm just amazed I said them all the way out for getting. <laughs> and so when you count the original table of nations, it's either 70 or 72, depending on whether you count some people twice through their sons, yeah? So the Septuagint, the Greek version of the uh, Old Testament um, 
has one number and then the Masoretic text has another number, 70 or 72. And it's the same here with Luke. It depends if you counted it the Greek way or the Hebrew way. And that's why the number's different, depending on whether they're counting it from the original. Yeah. So that's why there can be numbers. But the nations are measured in numbers of 70. And all the way through the Bible, when you see the number 70, God's trying to show you. So when Israel's sent into the nations, into Babylon, they scattered to the nations. How long are they there? 70 years, because they scattered among the nations. And it's the same when you see pictures of Antichrist. Go to this one. Go to Luke, uh, Judges chapter 1. Go to Judges chapter 1, uh, verse 7. So when the, uh, the Antichrist leader of uh, Jerusalem, Adonai Be Bezek, not Melchizedek, this is who comes after him, he's a t picture of Antichrist, he says, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, have I picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. He's a picture of Antichrist. He's ruled over 70 kings because the Antichrist is going to rule over the 70 nations. So when you see a, a picture of a bad king like Ahab had 70 sons, yeah? You'll see, you'll see in other places in Judges, Gideon's 70 sons are, are killed by a, another type of Antichrist, Abimelech. So that number 70 is a picture of all the nations. So that's why Jesus sent them out, sent 70 people out, because the gospel is going to go to all the nations. There's always logic in God's uh, methodology. Okay, can we go back to the chart then, please? So you've got, obviously, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there, but you've got the people there, but called nations. Uh, next one. Now you've got servants. Now, in, uh, in Revelation 21 and 7, the inhabitants there are, are called God's children. They will be my children. Just, um, and you'll notice in John's writings, so how does John's gospel begin? Those who believed God gives the right to become the children of God. How great is the, the love of God that is lavished upon us that we might be called the children of God, yeah? It's not a, it's not a cancellation, but it is an emphasis on why we're there. Obviously, believers and God's children are there, but they're called servants. You're there to do something. Just like Adam uh, was put in the garden to do something. So Adam was the human representative to run the planet. I have a sneaky feeling. Okay. And this is just a sneaky feeling. So don't, don't quote me as this is my theology. I have a sneaky feeling we might be given other planets and mm -hmm. galaxies to steward. I'm just a feeling, because God would always take him and say, look up at the stars, so shall your offspring be. And I don't think he's just talking about, you know, in that pretty. I think he's like, you're going to manage the universe, right? This is the city, this is the headquarters, this huge place. But the new, it's not just a new earth, it's a new heavens, yeah? So... Don't quote me on that because I'm not. I'm, it's just a theory that God's plan is a lot bigger than you think. It's not just the earth and the, the new Jerusalem. I think it's because it says we will, we will judge angels. Well, the angels run the universe. So perhaps there's a lot more to eternity than you think. Perhaps there's a lot more going on. And you know, these scientists keep finding Earth-like planets all over the universe. I wish they'd stop it. Just because you can't go. You know, they say, oh, we found an Earth-like planet. It's only 50 light years away. Oh, is it? So if we travel at the speed of light, which is impossible, it'll take us 50 years to get there. Well, perhaps the cosmos as we know it is going to have our influence in it a lot more than we think. But why servants? Servants in the New Testament is mentioned 155 times. The word leader is only mentioned for around 40 times. Isn't it funny? Our people like to call themselves leaders, but don't, call them, don't like to call themselves servants. You know, we like titles, don't we? The title most used in the Bible for anyone with any ministry or capacity is servant. Even the apostles called themselves servants. 
Paul, an apostle and servant. James, a servant of Jesus Christ. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. They were apostles. They, they were Jesus' brothers, James and Jude. They called themselves servants of Jesus. But aren't they family? Yes. But as my children will tell you, being a member of my family doesn't mean you don't do anything. It means more is expected of you. Okay. So next one then. So it's not just... Uh, the people there, servants, the, there's angels there. The messengers of God. Yeah? Now, just go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 9. We stopped here. We should have, if we'd have read down, we'd have read this. Revelation 22, verse 9. So the angel says to John, don't do that, because John's bowing down to him, thinking, wow, this angel's a mighty, you know, angel of God. Don't do that. What does the angel say? I am a fellow servant. The angel calls himself a servant. Right, you a mighty angel that helps run the cosmos. I'm not just a servant, I'm a fellow servant. I'm just like you. I serve God just like you do. I might have a bigger capacity at the moment. I might be running a galaxy somewhere for all we know. But the point is, he calls himself a fellow servant. That's the correct attitude to everyone in this city. We're fellow servants. Doesn't mean all our crowns will be the same. Doesn't mean all our rewards will be the same. Doesn't mean our inheritance will be the same. You remember the one with more talents was given more cities. The one who did more got more. The one who sacrificed more received more in eternity. But he doesn't just say fellow servant with you and your fellow prophets, okay? So in other words, the angel thinks everybody's a servant. The angel thinks we serve just like they do. I'm a prophet, so you're a servant then. I'm an apostle, so you're a servant then. Yeah, whatever you are, you're a servant, yeah? So the servants there, there's the angels there. The Bible tells us that are not angels, ministering spirits. They're servant spirits that God sends out throughout the universe. Okay, go back to the chart then. So there's angels there, which means there's other beings there. Yeah? I find it fascinating when, when Christians say they don't believe in extraterrestrial life. I do. I don't think it's E.T. in a, in a you know, flying saucer. But there is, there is life out there. I just think it's in different dimensions. You know, of course there is. There's all kinds of life God's created throughout the universe. We tend to call them angels, but there's other names and other creatures described in the Bible. And I think, I often wonder, you know, you know all these people that claim they've seen UFOs? Well, I believe they have seen UFOs because a UFO is an unidentified flying object. It doesn't mean it's E.T. and a flying saucer. It means they've seen something and they couldn't explain. Well, that happened all the way through the Bible. That's happened throughout human history. There's been encounters with things that you can't explain. Why do we think it's little green men from Mars? Well, it might be an angel going to get his milk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. What I'm saying is, as a Christian, sometimes, because we don't like to believe in nonsense or conspiracy theories, well, we do believe in angels. We do believe in principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. We do believe in cherubim and seraphim and all that. Well, sometimes people saw them. Now, I don't know how that fully happens with the interdimensional movement of angels. I, don't ask me to explain it, but don't rule out that it somehow doesn't happen anymore. We always did happen. You read all the ancient texts of the, the you know, the, the sons of God coming down, creating the Nephilim. All the ancient cultures said, yeah, people came down from heaven. And we all think, oh, they were just superstitious fools. Well, all of them, and they all said the same thing. Well, perhaps things did come down from heaven, if that's what they all said. Um, anyway, we'll not go down that line. And then the other thing that's there that we've just looked at is the tree of life. Yeah, which is what we're going to look at now. We might look at the river and some of the other things later on. But what is the tree of life? Because the river of life is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. We know that. Um, we'll look at that next time. But what's the tree of life? Well, is it a picture of Jesus himself? I think in many ways it is. 
but I think it's a, it's a lot more than that. And so in chapters 21 and 22, you'll, you'll see things are called life. So it's not a river, it's the river of life. It's not the water, it's the water of life. Yeah, it's not the tree, it's the tree of life. And so this, this, this word for life is something that is enforced in this city. Everything in this city is alive. Everything. It's all living. So the question is, what is life? What is it? How do you know the difference between something that's alive and not alive? What's the difference? It's, it's not good shouting stuff out to you because we don't know. We think we do. We've created scientific definitions of what we think is life. But any genuine scientist, if you ask them where life came from, they don't. That's why they're looking for life out. Because genuine scientists will say life can't have just happened. It had to come from somewhere. And so that this searching, and that's what a lot of these, you know, NASA projects are about. We're looking for where life may have came from. Why? Are you admitting it, it can't have just happened? Yes, it had to come from somewhere. And what is it? Are you alive? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> what is life? Let's go to the next chart. Everything's alive. So in eternity, the new heavens and the new earth that God creates, it's all alive. Yeah? The things that we've looked at, but, but everything here is, is alive. Now, John, who's writing Revelation, also writes John's Gospel. And 40 times he mentions this word, life. And as, as I'm sure you know, there's different words for life in Greek, but one specific, you know, spiritual life, zoe. Um, John even ends his gospel by saying, I have written these things so that you may have life, and believing in Jesus, you will have life in his name. John's purpose of writing the gospel and revelation is so you can have this thing called life. Didn't they already have it? Weren't they already alive? Well, not in this way, because this is a new life. This is an eternal life. And so when you read in Revelation, so just go down to the next one. When you read in Revelation, you'll see things that are called life, and there's a direct correlation between John's gospel of Jesus saying these things had life. So the people there in Revelation, in the city, Revelation 21 and 22, they're only there if their name is in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Yeah? It's not called a book. It's not called the Lamb's Book. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. Right? God keeps saying this word over and over again. And so, if you look in John's Gospel, Jesus would say, My words to you, the book, the, right, the, writ the written words, are spirit and life. My words to you are life. Without God's word in you, you aren't alive. And I don't mean memorizing script. That's not what Jesus is talking about. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's God's spoken Word into you that, that gives you eternal life. Without that, you're just biological life that will just die. God speaks His Word into you. The Bible says the Bible itself is living and active. God's Word is alive. It's not a text. It's not a manuscript. It's not just a written document. It is living life. That's what God's Word is. And that's why the Bible is written. Yeah? So it's not just the, the book, the Lamb's Book of Life, that's open there, that the people who are in are in this city. Next thing is it says the spring of life. Yeah? Yeah? Before it says river of life, before it says water of life, it says the spring. The spring. Now, I'm sure you know, if you go to John's gospel, we'll not turn there. When Jesus met the woman at the well, 
You see, a well, in, in Hebrew thought, there's water. So a well would be water, ma'im in Hebrew. But if the water is flowing, it's called haim ma'im. It's called water that's alive, living water, as we would say. So she's at the well, she's got natural life, but Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you would ask me, not for the well water, you would ask me for Chaim Mayim. You would ask me for living water, and then you wouldn't get thirsty again, because I can give you the life you're craving. And you remember the woman, she'd had five husbands. She was now living with a sixth man. Jesus is now the seventh man here, the number of perfection is saying, you can try to satisfy yourself as much as you want. You can move from husband to husband. You can fill your life with activity or sex or drugs or whatever. <laughs> I'm going to say rock and roll then. <laughs> sex or drugs or rock and roll. You fill your life with anything. It will not give you this. It will not give you high mayim. It will not. And he says, if you would ask me, it will be a spring. And he uses that word. Yeah, it will be a spring that will bring life, living water. Hi, Mayim. Okay, next one then. So then the spring, we'll look at this in more detail, we will look at the river next time. The spring then becomes the water, that's a river. Now a river is obviously much bigger than a spring, but it's the same source. Remember these come from the throne. These are coming from God himself. The Holy Spirit is the living water. So we, we see that in Revelation 22. But John records Jesus saying exactly the same thing on the, the Feast of Tabernacles. That's recorded in John chapter 7. And if you remember, uh, in the Feast of Tabernacles, the high priest would go down to the pool of Siloam, where the Gichon spring was, the living water, the Chaim Ma'im, and they would get cups of water they would go up to the temple and they would pour the water out and they would say this is the river of life and as they were saying that jesus stood up and shouted above them if anyone believes in me let him come to me and drink and out of his innermost being literally his belly will flow Mayim, a river of living water not just a spring that you've seen that guy do not just a ceremony, not just a religious activity, you will actually have, and then Jesus, the John says, by this he means the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who those who believed in him would later receive. So Jesus says, whoever is thirsty, come unto me, and it will not just be a spring, it will be a river. And in the city of God, at the end of time, that river's still there. So these things you will notice, you've got to have them now. If you're not in the book of life now, you won't be then, you won't be there. If you've not got the belief in Jesus now, the woman at the well, Jesus says, if you knew who I was, you would have the spring. You've got to believe in Jesus now. You've got to, you've got to let the Holy Spirit flow through you now, or it won't then. The river of living water has to be flowing now. And it says from within your literally belly. So in other words, it's something God wants to do in you before he takes you to a place. Before he takes you to the place, he's got to do it in you. Yeah? His word, his spring, his water, his river. Next one now. The tree of life. We'll look at this again in a little bit more detail. Now, because of translation issues, we might miss. So Jesus says, I am, I am the vine. Yeah? And we think, well, a vine is not a tree. It, it is in the original, the original Hebrew, um, anything made of wood is called etz. Yeah, so anything that's made of wood is, is called. So you'll even find that the cross that, that Jesus is crucified on is sometimes called tree. Sometimes it's called etz because literally that's what it means. It's wood, so it's, it's tree. So Jesus is the tree, but it's the fruit of the tree of life. Jesus, what did Jesus say? I am the bread of life, yeah? It's my flesh, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. 
It's only through eating from me. So the tree of life is a picture of Jesus himself, his body, his blood, the fruit, everything he does. It's a picture of Jesus giving us that life. Yeah, I do think there is a real tree and a real river there because I think they're the symbols of what God is showing us. But don't lose the importance. Don't think the metaphor is the reality. The reality is always Christ because Jesus says without him, you don't have life. So in other words, if you've not got Jesus now, you can't eat from the tree of life. It's not like a separate thing you can do. It's, it's linked with God himself. Yeah? So, next one. Jesus is there, the lamb, Christ himself. We told that, and in Revelation, Jesus calls himself, I am the living one. So the life in eternity is what you have now. Yeah? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? I'm the resurrection and the life now. Not in the future. I give you life now. Yeah? Everything God does is to give us life. Jesus gives us life now. I put there John 5, but he says this in lots of places. Jesus, just to get them to understand, he says, just as the Father has life in himself, so the Son has life in himself. So Jesus is saying, just as you say God can give you life, yeah, I am God. I can give you life. Just as the Father can, just as the Spirit can, just as I can, I give you life life okay next one then obviously the holy spirit yeah pictured by the river but there's lots of different phrases there i put revelation 11 and 11 because it says when the two witnesses were dead it says uh, the, the breath of god enters them and they come back alive and as i'm sure you know breath wind and spirit are all the same word whether it's Ruach in Hebrew or Numa in Greek, it's the same word. So in Revelation, it's the spirit that gives life. But Jesus said that in John as well. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Your flesh cannot give you life. It's the Holy Spirit that gives you life. And also it's wind. The wind blows where it listeth. So is everyone born of the Spirit. But it's the same word. Wind and Spirit are the same word. So the Holy Spirit, remember in, back in Eden, when Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day, it's the word Spirit, in the Spirit of the day, the wind of the day, the breath of the day. So the Holy Spirit, just as he was there in Eden doing everything, so he is here at the end of time in Revelation doing everything. Yeah? Final one then. Who else is there? Us. Yeah. Now we've already seen that we're there. Yeah, but do we understand we're there because we have life? We're not there to get life. You're there because you have it. These, these are, this is life in eternity. Yeah. So... Um, if you just go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, go to Revelation 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid. So this is a promise to the genuine believers in a church. The genuine, but not, not everyone who goes to church but the genuine overcomers, those who will be victorious in faith in the church. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So in the book of Revelation, God is promising people life, yeah? Did they already have it? Yes. Because... We know that as one obvious doctrine of the Bible. John 3, 16. Yeah? For God so loved the world, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall receive everlasting life. The very thing we're looking at. So you receive that life now. Jesus is saying, look, some people are going to put you in prison, and there was massive persecution breaking out, but be faithful, you'll keep your life. 
I'll give you that life as your victor's crown. You will have that life for all eternity, yeah? But there, if you remember when we looked at the seven churches way back at the beginning of this study, each of the seven churches was given a promise for the, for the overcomers in the church. Remember, some of the churches were in real bad state, and God said some of the churches he was going to cast into the Great Tribulation, and some churches they were going to be... Um, go through severe trouble but each of the overcomers in the church they were promised life yeah they were promised life so can we just go to um not the next slide the one after it the seven churches were all given seven promises for those in that church that had genuine faith and would overcome, yeah? So if you just look at these, just go down, we'll take one at a time. So in Revelation 2, the church at Ephesus, their promise was if they stayed faithful, they would eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, which we've just seen is there at the end. So God is saying to this church, you will get that if you are faithful. Yeah. Next promise is um, what we've looked at. You will you'll be given the crown of life, and that's what happens at the end. Those who are faithful receive crowns, and they are given life. Yeah, that was the church at Smyrna. Go to the next one. Uh, the church at Pergamum, they will be given a precious stone, and God's name on them. We've looked at the New Jerusalem. What is it? Precious stones. So you'll see that all the promises originally given to the churches at the end in Revelation in the, in the city of God, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, these are all now realized. Now, I'm sure you probably can't remember uh, when we looked at these seven years ago, but the promises are now realized. They are certain promises. They are real, real promises. Next one. So after Pergamum, you've got Thyatira. And the, the, the church at Thyatira said they will rule the nations. Well, we've just seen that the nations are being ruled in the city at the end of time. So that is realized at the end of time. Those who are faithful will inherit that. The next one, after Thyatira, you had Sardis. Okay, they will be robed in white uh, with the angels, as we've just seen. That is also realized in the city of God at the end of time. Next one, church at Philadelphia. They will, be, uh, they will be put in the city of God. They will be in my city. They will be given God's name. They will have that name. So we know that's realized because the city of God comes down out of heaven at the end of time. The complexity of the book of Revelation is mind-blowing. You know, the more you study, the more you realize there's no way a man can have written this with a, with a feather quill and a piece of parchment. Because it all matches up. You'd need a computer to write it, the way everything is cross-referenced. Like it, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing in its complexity. But it all adds up. Last one then, the church at Laodicea. They were promised uh, a throne. Well, that's what we've seen. There's the throne there, ruling on the thrones, ruling the nations. So you see that all the original promises given at the beginning of the book to the genuine believers are all fully realized as recorded there at the end. Now, I, I mean, you can't remember seven years ago what we talked about. I don't think even John 22 chapters later could actually remember what everything he's written said. When I'm writing a book, and I'm writing one at the minute, do you know the hardest thing about writing a book is remembering what you've already said? Because by the time you get to about 50,000 words, you can't remember what you've written. I once wrote a whole chapter uh, in one of my books because it took me a year to write it. And when I read, and when I reread it, I realised I'd read the, I'd written the same chapter twice because I couldn't remember what I'd written originally, and all that work for no reason. I wanted to leave it in just because I'd done the work. You know, sometimes you do something, you think I'll just leave that in, even though it doesn't make sense because I've already repeated it. But everything that it all ties up. Word for word, which again is the signature of God to me. It's the signature of the Holy Spirit that all this ties together perfectly. And not just in Revelation, but with the rest of the Bible. 
and the rest of the scriptures and stuff John hadn't even read. It still ties up with perfectly. It's the signature of God. All scripture is God breathed, yeah? It's written by the Holy Spirit. So all these original promises, all your promises, everything that God has promised in the Bible is literally realized in the new heavens and the new earth. Some of it's realized before that. You can hear it, your promises now, but it will all be literally realized. Jesus, when he went away, said, I am going away to prepare a place for you. If, and I think it's amazing that he says this next, if that was not so, I would have told you. In other words, he's saying, this is not a metaphor. I'm not winding you up. I'm not just telling you to believe in something that's never going to happen just to keep your hopes up. I'm not giving you false hope. He says, it's a real place. He says, I'm going to come back to take you to be with me where I am. It's a real place. Yeah. And Jesus says, if it wasn't, I would have told you. I just said, oh, it's not real, this guy. It's just a metaphor to keep you happy while you die. But no, he didn't say that. He says, it's true, it's, true, it's real, it's literal. Okay, spiritual, but literal. So can we go back to the previous chart then? So we looked at the tree of life as this living thing that is in the middle of this city. So what is the tree of life? Because if you remember at the beginning when God put Adam in the garden, even before uh, Eve, he says in the middle of the garden is the tree of life. Why? Why a tree? Why life? Isn't Adam already alive? Is Adam already eternal? Doesn't he have an eternal soul, an eternal spirit? Now, there's various theories about how the tree of life operated. One theory is that um, if you ate from it once, that was it, you lived forever. Another theory is access to it kept you alive forever. Yeah? I don't know which one's true. Uh, the point is, um, the tree of life was there in the beginning of the garden. But there were two trees. Because in the middle of the garden, in Genesis 2.9, there it says, in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or the tree of knowing good and bad. You could translate it like that, I suppose. So there's two trees, but they're not, they're not described as a good tree and an evil tree. They both sound good, yeah? The knowledge of good and evil sounds a good thing, doesn't it? You want to know the difference between good and evil, don't you? We all do. Yes, you do. Stop shaking your head at me. You do. You want to know the difference between right and wrong, don't you? You want to know, is that good or is that bad? Is that right or is that wrong? Do I do that or do I do that? Yeah. But there's a problem with that. How do you know if something's right or wrong? How do you know? If you want to marry someone, how do you know if that's right or wrong? You see, you can, you can tick all the boxes, can't you? You can follow God's word, which is a good, a good way, but you can't fully understand God's word, can you? You can't know everything God said. So sometimes you can think, well, I think God said this, but he might have said that. Sometimes I read the Bible, and there's a verse in the Bible for the opposite of everything you want to do, as well as a confirmation for everything you want to do. Have you ever noticed? So you can't just open your Bible and say, oh, speak to me, God. Judas hung himself. No, not that one. Um, you know, you, you can just, you, you can't, it's not like a magic box that you shake like a dice. It, you know, you can't go like, it's not superstition. It's not divination. You've got to like have all of God's word in its wisdom talking to you, but you can't know all of God's word. You can't know everything, can you? Should I marry this person? Well, they seem all right, but they might turn out to be horrible. And they were all right to start. So, oh, well, Shadna, you're not the person I married. No, they're not. They've changed. Well, God, why do you tell me? So you've got right at the beginning of the garden two options. 
Jesus said, you tell a tree by its fruit. A good tree has good fruit. A bad tree has bad fruit. That's how you tell people. Yeah? You all know someone who says they're good, but they're always doing bad stuff. Yeah? They're not good. Right? We can all make mistakes, but a bad tree has bad fruit. And if that fruit is continually rotten, it's a bad tree. Yeah? Now, the two trees in the Bible... Now, when we did the study on the Garden of God, I, uh, and, and in my book, this is three whole chapters talking about what trees mean in the Bible. So I'm not going to repeat all that. You've read my book. You heard the Garden of God series talking about what the different trees are. Trees are people in the Bible. You know, when Jesus touched the man, he says, I see men as trees walking. God in Deuteronomy will say, are people trees? You've got this this picture all the way through the Bible. So just as the gates had names of people and the foundations in the city had, represented people, I think the tree of life ultimately represents Jesus because he's the one who gives life and people are represented by trees. So what's the tree of knowledge and good and evil? Well, tr that's the other people, the other options you've got. Remember, there's no tree of knowledge at the end in eternity, but there was in the original garden. And God is clearly showing us what type of person do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who eats from the tree of life? Or do you want to be the person who knows the difference between right and wrong? And we think, well, I want both. Well, you can't. Because that's the trick Satan played on Eve back in the beginning. You will never know everything. You will never have omniscience. You will never be able to work everything out. So choosing to live by your knowledge, even though it might be the good knowledge, not the evil knowledge, will never work. It can't. God wants you to live by the life he supplies, and that life will supply wisdom so that the knowledge will come from your relationship to God. It's interesting that the, the word the King James translates for unity between a husband and wife is the word know. Adam knew his wife. But it's not knowledge as like in a scientific sense. You know, on the night of their honeymoon, I'll not get too graphic here, but on the night of their honeymoon, you know, when they were having their romantic dinner before they went to the bedchamber, bedchamber, I don't know why I said bedchamber, it sounds more Shakespearean, doesn't it? You know, they, they, were, they were going to know each other. Now, I'm sure Adam didn't get out an encyclopedia of biology and go, ah, Eve, uh -huh. you have these chromosomes. Ah, Eve, you have an ovary. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I'll not go there. You know, I don't think that's what it meant. I don't think it was that kind of knowledge. I think it was an, a, love, a, a love life they shared together. Well, obviously it was not just demanding to know every fact about something, because you can never know every fact about everything. You'd have to be omniscient, and you're not. And the trick that Satan pulled on Eve was, if you eat from the, if you live this life, if you become this person, if you just learn everything, and if you know everything, you won't need anybody to tell you, because you'll know what right and wrong is. I have people tell me this. I have people say to me, I'm not coming to church just to have somebody to tell me what right and wrong is. I know what right and wrong is. It's like, yeah, because you're eating from the tree of knowledge. You're supposed to be coming to receive life. If all you're getting is an increase of information, you might not have life at all. You might not even know God. The people who came to Jesus knew the Bible, but Jesus says, but you don't come to me to receive life. He says, you know the scriptures, 
but the scriptures talk about me. You don't come to me. You, you just want your Bible knowledge. Your Bible knowledge won't give you life. And so you've got these two options. And so these trees represent the two kinds of people you can be and whether you can belong to Jesus. And Eve chose not to belong to the tree of life. Remember, she's the, she's the bride. She chooses to belong to the other tree. Right. Now, if we're the bride, who do we belong to? So we don't want the other tree, do we? We know Jesus will supply everything. But if, what, if we know, what if we need to know something? Well, Jesus knows. We rely on him. Well, I need to know independently and separate, separately from him. No, you don't. You don't want to be that kind of person. You want to be the person who relies on Jesus' information. And since the fall, there's been that antagonism between man and woman and between all of us. We don't trust anybody. I need to know for myself. You can't know everything for yourself. What are you talking about? If I need to know for myself how this phone works before I use it, I'll never use it. I don't know anything about it. I don't know how they make the lithium batteries. I, d I don't know. I don't need to know. I just need to trust the person who made it. And I don't trust the people who made it, but I'll still use it. <laughs> but I trust Jesus. And the more I trust him, the more I learn, the more knowledge and information I'll get. But that's not why I trust him. I trust him because he is the author of life. And so at the beginning in the garden, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, what did they do? They got fig branches and put fig leaves over them. So they're walking up. What are they doing? They're, walk, they, they're walking about as if they're trees, as if God won't see them. You know, and God says, Adam, where are you? And I was like, <laughs> I'm a tree. God will think I'm a tree. It's like, God, God knows where you are, Adam. He made the trees. Stop pretending you're a tree. But notice what he did. He tried to look like a tree. And throughout the Bible, all the way through the Bible, these trees keep popping up at the center of everything. Even in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar has the, the vision uh, about the tree. Psalm says, my people are like trees planted by the streams of water. Because you are. You're a tree. But which kind of tree are you? Are you the tree that comes from life attached to Jesus? Or are you the tree that just knows everything? that just relies on your own abilities, your own intellect, your own willpower, your own volition, your own, the, well, good luck, because that will not help you in the long run. Information is actually very, very limited. We're now at a stage where artificial intelligence and computers will infinitely, infinitely know more than you ever will. So you are redundant, because the computer knows more than you. Yeah, and Jesus says, learn the parable of the trees and the fig tree and all the trees. Yeah, he cursed a tree, he, he talked to the trees, and and we looked at this in the study on the garden, so I'll not go over it. But there's always two options. Why is there no option in the new Jerusalem? Why is there only one tree? Because you've already made your choice. The bride's already married. There isn't another tree. Yeah, before you're married, before you're engaged, well, ladies, you have options. Yeah, once you're married, you don't. Right, when my wife goes home tonight, there's only one man in the house. There's not two. They better not be. <laughs> you know, if I go in the kitchen and there's, if there's another man there, you know, having a bacon sandwich, <laughs> and I say to my wife, who's he? And she goes, oh, that's tree number two. <laughs> that's the second, that's for if I get fed up. It's like, no, 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 you made your choice. The choice has been made. Yes, there isn't another tree. Now, before we got engaged, before that happened, you may have had other options. Not now. You've made your choice as a Christian. You belong to the tree of life. Yeah? And so the, the option has been made. But what did Eve do? She lifted up her eyes to the wrong tree. She saw that the tree was good. Ah, but... I know the tree of life, but this tree's nice as well. No. That's Satan tempting you for another way other than the way God has. God said, if you eat from that, you will die. What did Satan say? You won't surely die. God knows if you eat from this tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. And since Adam and Eve did that, 
man's pursuit is to become like God through increasing his knowledge. That is what we're doing right now. We will save ourselves through our intellect, our technology, our information, our scientific endeavors, our healthcare, whatever, whatever. We are making heaven on earth. We aren't. We're destroying the earth. But we're too stupid to know it because we're addicted to that tree. We're addicted to our educational attainments, thinking we're getting clever, which is just the essence of pride. We aren't. We aren't getting better at all. We're dying. We need a savior. Yeah? We don't know. So we don't go to the tree of knowledge. We go to the tree of life. And so throughout the Bible, we looked at it last week, when Moses came to the place where there was bitter water. Yeah? Maramayim, not Haimayim, not living water. God, he says, God, what do I do? And he says, he lifted up his eyes and God showed him a tree. Look at the tree, Moses. The tree gives you the life, the tree of life, the cross. And so, because cross is ets, it's, it's a tree. Jesus was hung on a tree. So when we look at the cross, it's the access into the tree of life. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all unto myself. He's the one who gives you life. Now, when Jesus was crucified, there were two other trees at the side of him. Yeah? Two thieves. They were both thieves. They were both dying. One thief said, save yourself and us if you're the Christ. And he was just giving Jesus information about how to save him. The other one said, Master, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know you're innocent. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. You'll be eating from the tree of life in paradise. What was the difference in the two men? Their moral behavior. No, they were both sinners. They were both thieves. The man says, I'm dying for what I deserve. They're probably murderers. We don't know exactly what they were, but this, they, they got the death penalty. But one man looked to the tree of life. The other man was just looking at the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge will not save you because it cannot give you life. However clever you think, it will make you. Okay, so the tree of life is there. There were two trees in the garden, but uh, in the final city in Revelation 22, there's just one tree. Next one then. So the tree of life. So in Genesis... When Adam and Eve chose the option, as we read there, the wrong option in Genesis 3, they were banished, not just from the garden, they were prohibited from eating fruit from the tree of life. You remember the cherubim, God says, right, do not let them now eat from the tree of life. Their eyes are opened, they think they're like God, they, they, like, they, they think they've become like me now. They think they know what to do. Let them think they know what to do. But they cannot. They cannot have this now. They will die just as God said. So they were banished. And whenever God spoke to people in the Bible, you'll notice he brought them back to a tree. Now, sometimes, because of translation, we miss that. When God spoke to Moses, he took him to a tree on fire. Now, we say it's a burning bush, but anything made of wood is ets. And he says, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Why? You're at the tree. You're in my presence. Moses didn't know it, but he'd just come into the, the temple of God. So that's where the tree is. Yeah? In the temple of God, in the holy place, there's a tree. We call it a menorah. A golden candlestick but it's an almond it's an almond tree it's in the shape of an almond tree there's a tree in the presence of god it's a picture of christ seven branched perfection full of the oil and the spirit of god but that's what it's a picture of the other th the other stuff were made out of wood and then overlaid with gold but the tree was made out of hammered gold not wood now you would think the one thing that should be made out of wood is the tree and the other stuff should be made out of solid gold. But God says, no, make the other stuff out of wood overlaid with gold, but make the, tr make the tree not out of wood. Why is he doing that? He's trying to show us what the tree really is. It's not a wooden tree. 
gold is the, it represents eternal holiness and purity of God. He's saying, no, this is the tree. And you'll see Abraham always came to a tree, the, the trees of Mamre, the oaks of Mamre, the oaks of Moray. And when he came to be a Sheba, he always built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. And then he says he plants a tamarisk tree. Well, I thought you always built an altar. Yeah, it is an altar. Abraham realized the altar is the tree. That's the cross on which Christ is crucified. And then when Abraham went to the top of Mount Moriah and he, his son had to die, what did he see? He saw the sacrifice in a tree, the ram caught in a tree. In other words, the tree provides it. The cross provides it. The cross is the access to the tree of life. The tree that killed Jesus is the tree that gives you life. He died on that altar, yeah? We mustn't abuse that tree as Eve did or she ended up naked. That's what Noah did as well. He abused the et's vine, the, the fruit of the vine. What happened? He lay naked. If you go back to the tree of knowledge, you lose God. You do not live through your own independent individuality. You live through reliance on God all the time. That's where your life comes from. Don't think that you can use God to take information from him and then live without him. That's not how it works. You were born of his bone flesh. You are joined to him like a man and wife. You don't act independently. You always come to that tree. Okay, now, so it's mentioned in Genesis, the tree of life there. It's called the tree of life. And then it's called the tree of life in Revelation at the end, as we've just seen in Revelation 22 and the promise to the church is there uh, at the beginning in chapter two and three. But it's also mentioned, the literal tree of life is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, but it's only mentioned in one book. All the other times the tree of life is mentioned is in one book. Don't bring it down. Does anyone know which book it, it is that it's, it's mentioned in? Yes. It's in Proverbs. Middle of the Bible. Psalms and Proverbs are in the middle of the Bible. Why? Because that's called the book of wisdom. You see, one of the main differences between the tree of knowledge and the tree of life is the tree of knowledge gives you information about what you think is right and wrong but the tree of life gives you wisdom and life and they're very different things because if you think about it you never really know something absolutely do you the only way you know something is if you have wisdom about a thing knowledge itself is not sufficient that's why the, one of the spiritual gifts is the, the word of wisdom. Because, you know, if you need to buy a car, how do you know if that? You don't know, do you? You don't know if that car's going to be in a crash. You don't know if it's going to get stolen. You don't know if there's something wrong with it, unless even if you're a mechanic. You know, you, you don't really know. It's the wisdom of God we need for life, isn't it? What job do we get? Where do we go? What do we do? We don't know. We only know how to live life through reliance on God. And so the the, all the other times the tree of life is mentioned other than Genesis and Revelation is only in the book of Proverbs. So God's showing us something very clearly there. There's metaphors of the trees all the way through. In fact, every book of the Bible has got a metaphor of the tree. But in Proverbs, it literally states this is a tree of life. Okay, so go to that one then. Proverbs 3 verse 18. Proverbs 3 verse 18. So here we've got the tree of life mentioned by name. It's only mentioned seven times here. She's a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Well, what's he talking about? Well, go to verse 13. And it tells us what he's talking about, because it's already mentioned it. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. So God is clearly telling us that the tree of life is the wisdom of God. Not the knowledge of good and evil, 
not information about what you think is right and wrong, not religious rules, not the Ten Commandments, although they're right. Remember, the knowledge of good and evil isn't necessarily wrong. It just won't give you life. You know, I'm going to use an illustration there about dieting, but I'm not going to. Because, you know, the more you try and eat correctly, the more you realise you haven't got a clue what you're eating is good for you or not. And the more you study, the more confused you get. You know, and the stuff you should have been eating, you know, years ago, they now tell you kills you. And, there's, you know, I'm sure, like, in 10 years' time, they're going to tell you lard and sausage rolls is good for you. <laughs> you don't know, do you? So, blessed are those who find wisdom. This is the tree of life. The Bible tells us Christ is the wisdom of God. The only way you're going to get through this life into eternal life, the only wisdom you're going to get is Jesus. If you haven't got that, good luck, because you might get stuff right, you might get stuff wrong, but it won't work either way. You'll still die, and you won't get into heaven. It's through Christ that is the wisdom of God. She is more profitable than silver, yields better than gold. And the whole book of Proverbs goes on about this. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Wisdom is how you live your life. Knowledge is information about life. Yeah? Go to James chapter 3, Chris. Go to James chapter 3. God wants us to have wisdom, not just information. James chapter 3, go to verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Well, those who know the Bible the most. Nonsense. That's not a bad thing. But you can know the Bible like a theological expert and live a life that's appalling. Let them show it by their good life, by the deeds done in the humility, listen to this, that comes from wisdom, not knowledge. You all know people that know everything. It doesn't mean they live a good life. God wants wisdom. Wisdom is how you live your life, not what you know. Let them show it by their good life. That's a wise person. A wise person is someone who can live a good life, not someone who can talk about it. Yeah? I'm fed up of people that can talk about stuff. You're probably fed up about me talking about stuff. I hope you don't judge me by me talking about stuff. If you're going to judge me, if, you can if you want, judge me by how I live my life, not my theological information. Judge me by, am I a good husband? Have I brought up my children right? Did I work hard at my job and my career? Have, am I trustworthy? That's how you prove you're eating from the tree of life. You can go to Bible college and seminary and get degrees and be a rubbish husband, a hopeless dad, and rubbish at your job. And there's, believe, believe me, there is not necessarily any connection. Some of the most educated people I've ever met are... <laughs> I'll not use words, but just hopeless at anything can't live a good life. The tree of life is wisdom. The prophet Daniel said in the last days there will be a vast increase in knowledge. That doesn't mean there's an increase in wisdom. Humans now know more than humanity has ever known and we're less able to live good lives, which just proves the foolishness of eating from the wrong tree. Okay, go back to the chart then. So the next one in Proverbs... I think, we'll, I think we'll finish when we've done the tree of life. I don't think we'll go on to the next one. So the next one in Proverbs is found in Proverbs 11 and verse 30. Let's go there, where the tree of life is specifically mentioned by name. So let's go to that one. Proverbs 11 
verse 30. So the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And the one who is wise saves lives. So you've got righteousness and salvation mixed in here. Once again, this is what the tree of life's called. The tree of life, the fruit of righteous is the tree of life. So it's the fruit of the tree of life that's linked to righteousness. You only get righteousness and one who is wise saves lies. So we've seen it's linked to wisdom. You only get righteousness and salvation from the tree of life. You will never get that through knowledge. Knowledge will not save you. It might help you to do this instead of that. It might get you a better education. It might, but it won't save you eternally. Neither will it make you righteous. Knowing what is good does not mean you are good. You are good if the life of God is in you, so you bear good fruit. Knowledge doesn't make you good. Knowledge can actually make you evil because you can use your knowledge for bad as, as well as good. No, it's the tree of life that brings salvation, salvation and righteousness. It's not what you know, it's who you know. If you know Jesus, you receive salvation and righteousness because Christ is our righteousness and his name, Yeshua, means God is our salvation. So he is these things. He is the tree, the very tree of life and the fruit, obviously, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of being attached to Jesus, the tree of life, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You won't get any of those things from knowledge. Knowledge won't give you peace. We think it will. And that's why we strive for it. If I just know it, that's why people gossip and talk because they think, if I just know more about it, no, it doesn't, doesn't bring you peace at all. Bring you love, doesn't bring you love. It's more likely to bring contention than love. Doesn't bring you joy. The more I know, the more I'm robbed of me joy. People come and tell, I just don't tell me. I don't want to know. No, you want to know? I really, really don't. It's not going to help me. No, it's the tree of life that brings these three things. There. Okay, let's go to the next one then. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Let's go to that one. As I said, the tree of life is only mentioned by name here in Proverbs. So let's go there. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. What is it you long for? The Bible says that it's only the tree of life that's going to fulfill your longing. What is it you really want? You see, people think, oh, if I can just find, you know, the, a good boyfriend. Oh, if I could just find a nice car or a nice house or a good job. None of those things will fulfill the longing within you because that's not what your longing is. Your longing is for eternal life. God said he has set eternity in the heart of man. You were created to belong to God. And any benefit he gives you, if he gives you, you know, a, a nice life, good children, a, a happy marriage, well, praise the Lord, but it's God himself that created all those things. You only get them from the tree of life. And that's the longing that shall fill. You see, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You see, if you're hoping for something that's not the tree of life, your hope will keep getting deferred. You'll hope for it, and then when you get it, you think, that doesn't satisfy me. Have you ever noticed that in life? I sometimes stand back and look at my life. I was saying this to Carolyn the other day. I said, if you could have told me at like 20 years old that I would have everything I have now, I'd be amazed. You know, I'd think, well, I'm going to have my own house. I'm going to have a, a car, a new car. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a family. And I'm going to, and it's like, wow, I'd have been over the moon. But I'm not. <laughs> it's not that I'm not pleased and thankful for those things. I am. But none of those, it's, that's not what satisfies me. I've realized it's knowing I'm doing what God wants. Being connected, that's what satisfies me. And all the other stuff then 
is a blessing that I enjoy because of the connection. So I enjoy my family and my life because of what God has given me. But without God, it wouldn't make sense. I'd just be longing for something else. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What we are hoping for, for is certain. We have a certain hope. The tree of life is real. Jesus is real. Heaven is real. It's all real. Our hope is certain. We are going to realize it in eternally, uh, in eternity. But everything in this world is just dust. That won't fulfill you. It's just like eating sand. It'll just make you dry and dead. The dust of the earth. That's not what we're hoping for. We're hoping for the life of heaven. Okay. Last one before we look at the tree of life in Revelation. So go back to the chart. So it's the longing fulfilled. In Proverbs 15, it tells us this, the spirit and life. Let's go there, Proverbs 15, verse 4. As I said, these are the only times it's, it's called the tree of life by name. It is all the way through the Bible as pictures, the cross being the ultimate example. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Now, I think what's being referred to here is the original understanding of the tree of life in the garden. Because when Eve had the options, who did she listen to? The tongue of God or the perverse tongue of the serpent? Yeah. She listened to the twisted truth. And that crushed her spirit. She died. Instead of listening to the soothing tongue, the true tongue, the, the word of God, don't eat, don't eat that tree. It'll kill you. She chose to listen to what's called the perverse. We would probably say the twisted. To perverse just means to twist something. And so she listened to twisted truth. That's the greatest danger for any Christian. Because we live in a society that wants to hear the juice on people. We want to hear the gossip. We want to hear the, you know, the slander of what's being said about someone. Even if it's not true, oh, well, I know, the, I know what's right and wrong. No, you don't. Once you listen to that, you'll entertain it, and it's not true. Or it's, it's twisted out of context. And this happens all the time. It happens to you, it happens to me all the time. People say, oh, I've heard you said this. Like, well, I did say that, but not like that. Not the way you've interpreted it. And that will, that will crush you. But if you listen to the truth, it's a tree of life. Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. My word is truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And you know what Pontius Pilate said? What is truth? Do you know why he said that? He was a politician. Politicians don't care about truth. They want the knowledge of good and evil. They're in the other tree. They want, how do I spin this so this sounds good? It's my knowledge about what's right. So if I have my knowledge about my manifesto and my portfolio, and I promise you what's right, because this is good, that'll bring about a good society. No, it won't. The only thing that brings about a good society is God. And if you remove him, it, no, it doesn't matter what you do. You know, the communist manifesto sounds wonderful. Everyone's going to live in paradise and harmony. What did he do? He killed them all. Why? Because it's just based on the tree of knowledge. It's not based on God. It's an atheistic philosophy. That's why atheism is so destructive, because you're removing God from something. So you're, you're in the wrong tree to start with. Yeah. Taste and see that the, the Lord is good. Eat from the tree of life, and you'll get freedom. If you eat from the other tree, it will crush your spirit. Okay, finally then, let's go back to the chart. We'll wrap up with this. I'll not go into any more. Uh, information tonight. So, the tree of life there, as mentioned in Revelation 22, is the promise to the overcomers that we've already looked at. It's the promise to the overcomers in the churches back in Revelation chapter 2. 
So in other words, this promise of the tree of life is given now to the churches. Yeah, if you overcome, that word overcome, or uh, it's literally to, to be victorious, to conquer. It's so that we can overcome now. Now, when we first looked at that one, the church promise of the tree of life in Revelation 2, it was seven years ago. The promise still stands. God's promise for you to overcome, to obtain the promise of the tree of life, it still stands because it's given to the church. Yeah? So if we're in the church, if we belong to God's church, that promise for us stands tonight. And he said the churches back in Revelation 1 and 2, the golden lampstand is the churches. So the tree of life, the church is joined to Christ. He's the vine, we're the branches. We're joined to him. We belong to him. And when we belong to Jesus, that life flows. It's interesting that God, when he mocks um, the children of Israel for building their own gods, he says, you cut down a tree and you fashion it into an idol and you bow down to a piece of wood. You worship the creation of your own hands. And that's exactly what the world is doing tonight. Man is worshiping, worshiping his own endeavors. We're going to create peace on earth. We're going to create a peace process. We're going to bring peace on earth. No, we aren't. Peace on earth only comes when Jesus comes. He's the tree of life. We don't create our own tree of life. That's just dead wood. Jesus is the living one who's alive forevermore. So the tree of life ultimately is Christ himself, but we're joined to that tree. And we get the benefit of that life through all the things it means, and there's more things than what we've looked at tonight. But that's just a taster. We belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads then. Father, thank you that you have said we will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And Lord, you have said that when we come to Jesus, we receive life. Lord, you said those who come to you receive life, those who believe in you receive life, and those who belong to you, you give them everlasting life. And so, Lord, we choose again tonight to belong to you, to receive that eternal life, and to live forever in eternity with you in the paradise of God. Father, seal these truths in our hearts so we can live them, not just knowledge or information, but living wisdom that we can live by your Spirit in this world, living to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all.